want to go over those uh, just to wrap that up. And then I'll repost these as Lecture 5 up in our website <coughs> after the end of today. And then uh, when we start today's lecture notes for Lecture 6, we'll start off with that question that Seth and Ari were talking about. So this one is not dissimilar. We'll go through this one first. Uh, so this is number 50. And with these projectile motion problems, the thing I hope that you can do is sort of start from scratch with the gravity vector. Trying to remember that formula for range and the formula for um, uh, maximum height and those things is not that useful. And if you change your inputs at all, sometimes those formulas don't even work. So it's better to be able to sort of start from scratch. And here we have a ball that's being hit three feet above home plate. There's the initial velocity. And the only force acting on it is gravity. So we're just going to start from scratch with the gravity vector. Gravity is pulling straight down. So, oh wait, there is a little extra piece of, of information here, actually. There is going to be another piece of acceleration, not just gravity. There's this five feet per second squared that is affecting it in the northward direction. And the way they told us to draw our coordinate system, if we look up here, uh, they say to assume the x-axis is east, the y-axis is north, and the z-axis is up-down. So we're going we're gonna to draw it like this. And we'll just put uh, east here, north there, and this is up. And so our velocity in the downward direction is definitely negative 32. And then 5 in the northward direction, that's our second component. So that's going to drop in right there. So that'll be our gravity. Bless you. Is that good for everybody? And then. Negative 32, oh, because it's in feet. It's in feet, right. Yeah. yeah. If we're in meters, we would do the 9.8. There's another one I think we're going to do in here in a minute. Actually, I think the next problem has a 9.8. So this is a constant vector. When you integrate a constant, you get a linear function of t. So when we integrate both sides here, we get the velocity vector. That will be the acceleration <coughs> multiplied by t plus the initial velocity. The initial velocity is given to be 30, 30, 80. So that will be our velocity vector. If we want to clean it up, we can. We can you know, combine the x components, the y components, and the z components. Up to you. R, as a function of t, we integrate again. So we can let the constant sit out in front here. And then we integrate t, we get t squared over 2. And then we integrate our constant vector here. And we integrate a constant, you get a multiple of your variable, so multiple of t. And then we have to add the initial position onto the end there. That will be our constant. And what is our initial position? 3, 0, 0, because we're starting with the ball at 3 above. Oh, not 3, 0, 0. Close, but what is it? 0, zero 3, 0. 0, 3, 0, because, oh, no, that's not right either. <laughs> what is it? Zero, zero, 003. Because the up position, the up coordinate is the z component here. That's our third component. And the ball is up being launched at three feet. So it's right about there. That's where we're launching it. So it should be zero in the x direction, which is e, zero in the y direction, which is n, and three in the up direction. OK, so there's our position vector, kind of messy. And we can clean it up by combining the x's, combining the y's, and combining the z's. So if we combine our x's first, the only non-zero one is 30t. <coughs> combine the y's, we get 5t squared over 2 plus 30t. And then combine our z's, we get negative 16t squared plus 80t plus 3. So that's our position at time t. Plug in t equals 0, you're at 3. You want to figure out where 
this thing lands, so this thing's going to be launched upward and land somewhere out there. And our range is going to be you know, that distance right there. The range is only going to depend on the x and y components. So if we took the x component, the y component, and we did the distance formula, that would calculate the range for us. To figure out how long it takes for it to land, we're going to plug in y equals 0. We're going to say, hey, when, and not y. Do I, do I mean y or do I mean z? z in this case. We want to know when the height is 0. If we're doing the two-dimensional ones, it's y equals 0. For this three-dimensional one, it's z equals 0. So we're going to set that equal to 0. And not a factorable quadratic. Throw it into Desmos. Uh, and I, does anyone remember, what, does anyone know what the t value is there? It's probably going to be like, I think it's 5 or something like that. We can throw it into Desmos quickly, though. And I think that's 5.04. 5.04, thank you. If you throw it into Desmos, you'll see your intercept very easily. So 5.04 seconds. So that's obviously the flight time of the ball. That's how long it's in the air. And if we want to know, uh, so the velocity and position vectors, we did that. Sketch of our trajectory. Determine the time of flight. OK, we just found that. And that's how long it's flying. And then the range. So we're going to have to take that t value and plug it back in to figure out what these x and y components are. Once we know those, we can do the Pythagorean theorem and get the distance i.e. the range. So the, <coughs> the range will be the square root of the sum of the squares. So we're going to do 30 multiplied by 5.04. That will all be squared. And then we're going to take the y component, put in our 5.04, so that will be squared right there. And divided by 2 plus 30 times 5.04, and then that whole quantity is squared. And somebody type that in and get that range. Do we know what that is? I believe we're going to get somebody can type it in. Tell us when we, you get there. I think it's like 260 something feet. So some big number of feet. 234. 234. Thank you. If we typed all that in correctly. So range of the object. And then max height. Max height, the simplest way is to figure out when the derivative of what component is 0. Derivative of the? Z. So Z is the up-down one, right? So we want the rate of change of up down to be zero. So we'll take the derivative of the z component since that's measuring our that's our up down measure measure. So z equals minus sixteen t squared plus eighty t plus three. We take the derivative minus thirty two t plus eighty. Set that equal to zero, and t will equal sixty four plus looks like. Two and a half, even? Two and a half? Mm -hmm. Two and a half seconds for max height to be achieved. All right. And to actually calculate that max height, what do we do with that two and a half seconds? Plug it right back into Z. That will give us our max height, because Z is measuring how high we are. Does that make sense to everybody? There's our range. And if we plug that back in, our max height. Will be we're going to Z, so minus 16. So we're going to do minus 16 times 2.5 squared plus 80 times 2.5 plus 3. And what do we get when we plug that in for our max height? 103 feet. Thank you.
Okay, now one other thing, if we wanted to be really precise about the trajectory here, we would take our t value of 5.04, plug it into x and y, so that we can get the E and N directions and get that a little more precisely if we want to mark up the, the E and N axes. But that's good enough for our purposes. Any questions on how we would do any of that? Does that so all make sense? For the range, you only use the X and Y components? Mm-hmm. Because okay. the ball is going up into the air, but it's landing down into the XY plane again. So the range is that lateral distance from where it started to where it ended. So. Yeah, we don't need the z component for the for the range. <clears throat> All right, this one is a little messier. This one says, suppose we wish to fire a projectile over a horizontal ground from origin and attain a range of a thousand meters. So we're dealing with a two-dimensional case here. We want the range to be a thousand meters. We want to be out here. There are an infinite number of trajectories that we could use. Lots of them. Some of them, are, of course, are not attainable mechanically, but all of these paths would work. Now, the question here is asking specifically about the, uh, the, the firing angle, and so I'm just going to jump to these formulas here. This doesn't make sense to build up from gravity. We, we're really focusing on all these paths. So let's go ahead and just jump to the shortcuts here. And in particular, the range, we want it to be 1,000. So that's going to give us some information about the initial speed. Now, some intuition. Hopefully, it's obvious. If it's not, let's generate it to be obvious. The lower the launch angle, the higher the initial speed has to be to attain a 1,000 meter range. Is that intuitive to everybody? The lower you have your launch angle, the faster that projectile needs to be leaving in order to make it 1,000 meters. Okay. So we've got that, that going on. So we kind of think to ourselves, oh, there's a lot of possibilities here. All right, so let's see. That's the speed squared sine of 2. Alpha, they are talking about meters, so we're going to use a 9.8. So there's our range. <clears throat> Multiply by both sides by 9.8, so we're going to get 9,800 on the left side. <clears throat> or 98,000, what, what do we get? 1,000, 1, 2, 3, 9,800. And if we divide by sine of 2 theta, or 2 alpha is what they gave us in this case, we get speed squared. OK. Now, the first part of this says sketch a graph of the initial speed. So if we want to solve this for the initial speed, the initial speed is that. We would have the square root of 9,800 all divided by sine of 2 alpha. And we can do some simplification in there. They're not asking us for a simplified value, so we can just graph this pretty easily with Desmos. You can change that into a cosecant if you want. So they're curious about the values for alpha between 0 and pi over 2. And let's just take a look at what that initial speed looks like. settings there, so x is, let's go 0 to, um, let's just go 0 to pi, I guess, y's, go 0 to 400, I think that's enough to get a graph. Alright, so there is the graph, uh, let's do the x-axis by steps of pi over 4, just so we can see where those x values are. All right. Oops. Okay, so there's a graph we're looking for. That's what they're asking for. 
So that's the graph of the initial velocity. And you can kind of see um, that the initial velocity, if our angle is super small, the initial velocity has to be very, very large. And then we have this medium place here at pi over 4, where that is going to be the angle where we need the least velocity. So that's what we're, that's what we're kind of targeting. Uh, let's just take a snapshot of that and put it in our picture. Put it in our notes. And that's this one. All right, so there, there it is. There's the, the function. So that's part A. Sketch a graph of the initial speed required for all angles between uh, 0 and 5 or 2. Don't want to go higher than pi over 2. <laughs> Don't want to go pi over 2 exactly. Might be the last time you fire this projectile. <laughs> so the second part of it says what firing angle requires the least initial speed. And from our picture, we see pretty clearly that that firing angle is pi over 4 from the graph. And if we want to do it with math, I want to point out something that hopefully is clear, but I, I feel like it is not always clear. What, what do we do if we want to minimize a function? Just take the derivative. Take the derivative, set it to zero, get our critical point, plug it back in, and do whatever we have to do. Now, the function that we're dealing with has a big square root in it. That looks kind of messy. Is it clear that this function, this speed function, and the speed squared function have the same critical points? Think of it this way. The, the angle that minimizes the square root is also going to minimize the square there. Does that make sense? Like if, if I take this number here, and I imagine its graph, if I imagine that number and then I imagine its square root, the square root is going to have the same critical values. If you, um, so think of it this way. If I'm trying to, try, imagine we're trying to maximize something. If we're trying to maximize distance, the maximum distance is going to yield the maximum distance squared also. Right? You agree with that? So that idea we can apply here, and we could just look at the derivative of that function instead, and it's going to correspond to the same critical value of alpha if we want. That's going to be, now things could get a little funny based on numbers, but that, that's pretty easy, here. that's an easier function to differentiate. It doesn't matter though, if we want to just be super careful, we can say that we want to take the derivative of that function, so we would differentiate it with respect to alpha, and we're going to differentiate this guy with respect to alpha. And maybe it's going to be a little easier if we put this, instead of dealing with quotients, we could do this type of thing where we, where we push this guy up, make him cosecant into alpha. It's probably easier to differentiate that. So when we take our derivative, we will get 1 half. And then that quantity to the minus 1 half. Minus 1 half multiplied by the derivative of the inside there, and the derivative of the inside, I don't need that dot anymore, the derivative of the inside, derivative of cosecant minus cosecant cotangent, and then we have to use the chain rule, so minus 2 cosecant of 2 alpha cotangent of 2 alpha. Then we set that equal to 0. All right, so let's think about this. When is that thing zero? Hmm. Hmm. Let me rewrite it just to make sure that what I'm, bless you, what I'm about to say is not going to seem completely bizarre. So if we simplify the numerator, we just have minus. Let's, I'm not going to write it out with sines and cosines. That you can imagine by this point in life. 
Okay, so we've got that. Uh, the sine, the cosecant is one over sine, so sine can't be zero, right? That'll that'll cause an undefined situation. So we're trying to figure out when this whole thing is going to be zero. Certainly, we don't want to consider when sine is zero. When we look at cotangent, cotangent is cosine over sine. So what's going to force that factor to be zero? Cosine. That's it. We need to know when cosine of 2 alpha is zero. That all reduces to that, figuring out when cosine of 2 alpha is zero. Sine of 2 alpha creates undefined values, so that doesn't matter. The only value of alpha that's going to cause this to be zero is when cosine is zero. It's the only way. So we go ahead, we look at a unit circle, and we're told that alpha is between <coughs> zero and pi over two, which means two alpha is between zero and pi. So when we look at a unit circle here to calculate our angles, we just need to look at a four sector circle here. So cosine of an angle is zero. Cosine of an angle is zero there, if we're considering the interval from zero to pi. All right? So 2 alpha is equal to 5 over 2. Divide by 2, and we get the mathematical conclusion that we saw geometrically from our graph that pi over 4 would be the angle that would require the least initial velocity. The least initial speed, I should say. Initial speed. All right, the last piece of this says, what firing angle requires the least initial speed? Oh, yeah, we just did that. Can you just like, you know that though? Like the 45, 45 degrees? degrees? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we, yeah. We, our experiences with that, you know, like throwing basketballs and all sorts of things. Yeah, but that only works if you're throwing to the same level that you started from. If you start like... Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good point. So our experience in life is that like, if we're throwing a basketball, we've got the, if you're throwing it higher than you normally would, it's going to take more speed. If you're going to throw it lower, it's going to take more speed. But you know, there's going to be a happy medium, right? And so if it's symmetric, pi over 4 would be our, would be our flight. OK. All right. Any questions on that? Um, is there anything else I want to say about that? All right, let's move on. So, let's see. I think we, yeah, we zipped through this. There was an integral we came to. Okay, that we didn't get to. Here, all right, that's where uh, I stopped on one integral, and I didn't want to spend class time, and then after class, I picked myself when I realized it. So we had come up to this position here, and I had made a comment that, oh, if it was, if it was 8 minus 8 cosine, we could integrate it easily by reverse engineering a power reduction identity. Right? We could turn it into sine squared, and then the square root of sine squared is sine. And it would work really easily. But this one actually works really easily also. So it's pretty trivial. Let's do it. Let's factor out the root 8. So we're going to have 2 square roots of 8. Pull that all the way to the front. And this is one of those ones that once you see it once, you're like, oh, yeah. And I haven't been teaching calculus for a few years, so it didn't stick in my head. It wasn't as obvious as it normally would be for people doing calculus. If you could, the whole benefit of using that power reduction identity is that it takes the inside of the square root and it would turn it into a square, which you can then take a square root of, and it reduces it to an integral of a single trig function, sine or cosine. Right, so that's what, that is kind of an important calc 2 type of thing. Like, oh, if I could do something to force that to be a square, then I could take the square root and I'd have, an, I'd have a trig function that's not 
buried in a square root, causing a problem. Well, we can do that, actually. If we multiply top and bottom by 1 plus sine in square root, that'll do it. That'll do what I just said. That'll create, in the numerator, inside the square root, 1 minus sine squared, which is cosine squared. Square root of cosine squared is cosine. And then we can use substitution very easily. <clears throat> so let's do that. So up top, we're going to end up with just cosine theta. Downstairs, we still have a square root, but this is totally fine because the oops, direct substitution will work here. let u equal 1 plus sine, the derivative is in the numerator, so we're golden. That will be perfect. So du will be cosine theta d theta, and this thing will unravel really fast. Okay, our limits are now different because we're going to du. I'll just leave them blank for the time being, put an asterisk or something. They're not going to be u limits. You could calculate the u limits if you want. It doesn't matter. So this will end up being u to the minus 1 half du. Right. Square root of u down below brings up as u to the minus half. Cosine theta d theta, that's du. That integrates beautifully. So we're going to get u to the 1 half divided by 1 half, which is 2 times the uh, square root of u, u is 1 plus sine, so let's just plug that back in. And now we're back in theta limits. Oh, and I put a theta instead of a u there. Let me get a u in there. And then this will be back to our regular limits, where we started with theta. So that's 4 square roots of 8. Uh, sine of pi over 2 is... 1, so that's going to be 2, minus what we get when we plug in the other one, and that's going to end up being 0, right? Sine of minus pi over 2 is negative 1, 1 minus 1 is 0. So we end up with, however that simplifies, I think 16? 16. Yeah. Square root of 16 is 4, 4 times 4 is 16. So that's how you finish off that little integral there that seemed a little sneaky at first. Direct sub. OK. Any questions on that? Let's see. We finished that. And then we had a couple questions right at the end in this package of notes that I wanted to get to that involve arc length. So let's talk about arc length. So I've mentioned that there's a whole bunch of parameters. As you're graphing a curve, you can choose. There's an infinite number of parameters that you could use. And so the question is, is one more valuable than another? And the answer is yes. The arc length parameter is really valuable for a lot of reasons. Um, the primary reason an arc length parameter is helpful, we'll see in the next section in 11.9 when we're trying to find curvature. And we saw last time that if, when we're talking about acceleration, I had made a comment about uh, there's no acceleration if the acceleration vector is perpendicular to the velocity vector. And that's not, from a physics point of view, that's not exactly accurate. What is probably the better thing to say is there's no speed increase or decrease if the acceleration vector is perpendicular to the velocity vector. There's no speed increase or, or decrease. There is a change in velocity. Was, what was your name? Bradley. Bradley. Like Bradley mentioned. <coughs> there is a change in, in uh, velocity, though, but it's, it's purely a directional change. It's not a, it's not a speed change. So if the acceleration vector is perpendicular to the velocity vector, we don't have a speed increase or decrease, but we do have a direction change. And if that acceleration vector is truly perpendicular, you're going to be moving in a circle. You know? So 
uh, if you're not moving in a circle, your acceleration vector will form an angle with your velocity vector. And the component of acceleration tangential will create a speed increase or decrease. And the component that's orthogonal or perpendicular to velocity, that's going to cause a change in direction. And that change in direction, we're going we're to talk about as curvature. So the component of acceleration in the, in the perpendicular direction will change direction. And curvature is going to give us a measure of that change in direction. And so what we're going to imagine in our head is that, OK, if we've got a curve, if we imagine a bunch of unit tangent vectors, so if we take our velocity vector, which is not necessarily of unit length, and we scale it down so it's always a unit length vector, that's going to act like a measuring stick for us. If we take the derivative of the unit tangent vector, the only thing that that's going to measure is the turning. If we're dealing with, a, if that vector is of one length all the time, and another way to say it is that the, the curve is a unit speed curve, so speed's not changing. So if I choose an arc, so if I choose the unit tangent vector, which is forced to be one unit long all the time, there's only two things that can change. It's speed and it's direction. And if it's speed's not changing because I forced it to be of unit length all the way, the only thing that's changing is direction. And so that's how we're going to define curvature. We're going to look at that unit tangent vector, and we're going to look at the rate at which it's changing. And the rate at which it's changing will tell us how much the curve is turning. The faster a curve turns, the higher the curvature. The slower it turns, the lower the curvature number will be. Curvature is always a positive number. OK. And one other thing I, I'll just mention about curvature, the most obvious object to talk about curvature with is a circle, because it, it's a good touch point. And the curvature of a circle, 1 over the, over the radius. So a circle of radius 1 has curvature 1. Circle of radius 2 has curvature 1 half. And so that fits with that intuition that the more gentle the curve is turning, the smaller the curvature value. So if you have a circle of radius 10, the curvature is 1 tenth. You know, so the smaller the circle, the, the higher the curvature value will be, and it's directly uh, related to the radius. Flip the radius, and you get the curvature for a circle. OK, so the question then is, all right, if I've got a random parameter t, how can I force a curve to have a, 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 an arc length parameterization? All right, and here's how we do it. We're going to figure out the relationship between s and t. If we can figure that out, we can then replace the t with what it's equal to in terms of s. So we're going to come up with a relationship between s and t, replace t with s, or, yeah, replace t with s, and then we'll have an arc length parameterization. Uh, let me say one other thing before we actually do it. If you have your curve, maybe I should draw it up here. If you have your curve like that, and this is t equals a, that's the start point, and this is t equals Actually, let me make it S. I want to make it S. I'm trying to point out something. If we have an arc length parameterization, some of the benefits. So if this was S, I shouldn't use A here because that's kind of connected with, let me just think for a second. No, no, I can use A because it's S goes from, this dummy variable is U. We can think of it as S goes from A to B. That's totally fine. So if S goes from A to B and it's an arc length parameter, what that means is the length along the arc can be found really easily. What would the length along this arc be if this is an arc length parameter and that's A and that's B? That distance along there, what would that be? Not even an arc length formula. It's even simpler. If we're on a if we're on a on a on a, uh, on a real line and we're going from say A to B, where A is at negative two and B is equal to five. A minus B, uh, B minus A. Right, so if, if we happen to have a horizontal situation, a linear situation, if you want to know the distance from A to B, if it's linear, it's nice and simple. You just do end point minus initial point. You get the distance, right? That's the beauty of an arc length parameterization. What it's doing is counting along the curve. That's, so it's taking our ruler and bending it to the curve. If you have an arc length parameter, and you go from s equals 1 to s equals 10, that distance is 9. 
Okay, so the distance here would be b minus a is the uh, arc length. All right. Another benefit is that if we take the derivative of if we have an arc length parameterization and we take the derivative, we bless you, we will get a unit speed curve. We will get a curve that has constant velocity of one. And the benefit to that also is that if we took the second derivative of that, that would give us what? <coughs> so if we think about, think about just the regular situation, driving your car, regular linear motion. If you take the derivative, you get velocity or speed. And if you take the derivative of that, acceleration. So if you have a unit speed curve, if you've parameterized it according to arc length, the second derivative will be the speed change along that curve if you have an arc length parameterization. So there's a couple of benefits. Sometimes you can't come up with a unit speed parameterization. And then you need a different formula. So if you do have it, it's got some really nice benefits. So we will know, so what this is doing here, this formula is going to give, this is a function of t. So this is creating arc length as a function of t. So basically what we're doing is integrating speed over the interval. If we integrate speed over the interval, it will give us a relationship between s and t. If the speed happens to be 1, then we say it's a unit speed curve. It's an arc length parameterization if the speed is 1. And why? Why, would, why do I know that? Let's just assume for a second that that's true. Just look at what happens. So if we are integrating from a to t 1 what do we get over here as the result if we're just integrating a differential t minus a so if t goes all the way to the end to say b you'd end up with b minus a the whole length and as you're moving along the curve as t is changing, s is changing, and it's going to measure the distance as you, as you move along the curve. So t minus a, that's the length of this interval. So if t is 5, 5 minus a. If t is 10, 10 minus a. So, this, so if that is 1, if the speed is 1, then it truly does measure, this integral truly does measure the length along the curve. OK. I mentioned this last time, just say it again. It's an important thing. Uh, especially as we go forward and talk about surfaces. So a curve is smooth on an interval if the derivative exists at all t in the interval and the derivative is not the zero vector. Because if it's the zero vector, there could be some weird hidden cusp. So for it to be smooth, we say all the derivatives exist and they can't simultaneously be zero. So if you're dealing with two dimensions, you have an f and a g. f prime and g prime can't both be zero at the same time. 3 space, f, g, and h, the derivatives of those can't all be 0 at the same time. If you're in 4 space or 5 space, same thing. You can't have simultaneous derivatives being 0, or there could be a hidden cusp. So here, let's calculate. Determine whether the following is a, a unit speed curve. It's a parameterized curve. It's called a unit speed curve if the velocity is always 1. Well, let's find the velocity. So the velocity, it's a function of t. Um, looks like we're going to get a constant vector. So it's a candidate. It's a candidate to have a constant speed of 1. Let's see what the constant speed of this is. So that's the velocity vector and then the speed is the square root of the sum of the squares? Uh, yes. So this shows us that this is a unit speed curve. This is a curve parameterized by its arc length. So yes, this uses arc length as a parameter. We also call it a unit speed curve. Let's go to another one. This guy. So velocity vector. Will be 
that. And then we have to find the speed. And the speed is the length of the velocity vector. And so that's 25 sine squared. Oh, yeah. We're going to get some nice like terms here. We're going to get some Pythagorean beauty here. And I have to take the square root also of all that. So we'll get 25 sine squared plus 25 cosine squared, which is just 25 inside the square root. All right, so we get 5. So that's not a unit speed curve because the velocity is not 1. It does have constant speed, though. So here is how we will develop. You might have an intuition for how you could change your, your uh, t in the equation so that you do get a unit speed curve. But here's the formal way we would do it. We said that s of t is the integral. So that makes it a function of t right there. That integral is a function of t. Right, this is some, this is going to be a function of t. And they said start, they had the formula said start at a. Here we're growing from 0 to pi. So let's just start at 0. So we're basically trying to measure along the curve starting at theta equals 0 or t equals 0. And then we have to integrate the speed. And we use a dummy variable to integrate. And we integrate, we get 5u, 0 to t. So we get 5t. So this gives us the relationship between s and t. s is 5 times t. So we're going to take the s and divide it by 5 to get our substitution. So this tells us then, this tells us that we can change this to an arc length parameter. R of s is going to be found by changing all those t's to s over 5. So minus 5 sine s over 5. Ooh. S is a tough sometimes to write on these boards. Cosine S over 5. And then 4 cosine S over 5. So that will be an arc length parameterization. And to test whether it truly is an arc length parameterization, we do what we just did. Find the velocity, find the speed, speed will be 1. Because we will get, with the chain rule, all these fives out in front. This is going to cancel out here. You're going to multiply by a fifth, so you're just going to have a sine. Here, you're going to multiply by a fifth. You'll have a three-fifths and a four-fifths. Three-fifths squared plus four-fifths squared is 25 twenty-fifths, and it will be 1. So if you go through the computation, the velocity and then the speed, you'll get 1 there. So that's a unit speed curve. So this integral is how we're going to decide what the relationship between s and t is. So that tells us the only way we can get a unit speed curve, the only way we can get an arc length parameter is if you can integrate this thing. If you have some crazy speed, you're not going to be able to integrate it. And so then you can't come up with an arc length parameterization. It's got to be a function that's nice enough that you can find an antiderivative for it. All right. Uh, let's see. I don't want to do this one. We've, we've done enough. Let's, let's just take a look at the cycloid for a minute. That last one's also super easy. I don't want to do that. Let's just take a look at the cycloid for a moment. Okay, so this is an example of a curve. It doesn't have an xy equation, a Cartesian equation. It only has a parametric form. And uh, this says to show that the length of one arch of the cycloid is 8a. And I want to just start this. I don't know if we need to go all the way through the whole thing. But we want to show that the arch has length 8a. We're going to integrate the speed over the arch. And that will give us the distance traveled. So x prime up here, a is a constant, so it will float to the front. And then the derivative inside here is 1 minus cosine t. y prime, same thing. a floats to the front. Derivative of 1 is 0. Derivative of cosine is negative sine. But there's a negative in front, so that becomes just sine. No, actually, I don't need parentheses. Then. So that becomes just sine. 
So that's our velocity vector. Speed will be the square root of the sum of the squares. They didn't use a v anywhere in here. So we'll say this for our, the velocity vector for the speed. We're going to do the square root, sum of the squares. So we're going to end up here. We'll have an a squared. And then when we square that, we'll have 1 minus 2 cosine of t plus cosine squared plus a squared sine squared of t. So that's all inside the square root there. And that tells us that our speed is, all right, we'll distribute. Well, actually, the a squared can factor out to the front as an a. And then on the inside, we have 1 minus 2 cosine of t plus cosine squared plus sine squared. That, of course, turns into a 1. So we have 2 minus 2 cosine of t. That's the speed. So then our arc length is going to be the integral of all this from 0, I think it's a 2 pi, right, to get all the way across one arch. 0 to 2 pi. A can factor to the front. And then we're going to integrate that. So that'll give us the arc length. All right. Let's factor out the root 2 so that we have square root of 2 times a, integral 0 to 2 pi. And then we have 1 minus cosine of t. Suggestion was, hey, can we multiply by 1 plus cosine over 1 plus cosine? That will work. One hitch, though, fundamental theorem of calculus says what has to be true about the integrand over the interval for the regular anti differentiation process to work? Continuous. Who said that? Continuous. So this guy, to use the anti derivative, the fundamental theorem of calculus has to be continuous over this interval. If you do that multiplication, if you do 1 plus cosine over 1 plus cosine in square root, then you get a bad point at uh, pi. So you could do it that way and then go from 0 to pi and double it. And that would work totally fine. So that will absolutely work. The other way is we can use a power reduction identity because it's a cosine in there. So we could do that also. So either of those techniques will work totally fine. Um, let's use the power reduction identity just because we haven't used it yet. So power reduction in this case, if we double both sides here, we would get 2 sine squared of t is equal to 1 minus cosine of 2t. This is an identity, which means it's true for every t. So we can then put in t over 2 for t. And so that gives us a clean expression for 1 minus cosine of t. So, and and here we don't have to worry about a continuity issue because that function that we're going to choose here, 2 sine squared of t over 2, will end up being that. And um, there's no division by 0 anywhere. This function is continuous on that interval. And we will get. Root 2 times root 2 is 2, so we're going to have 2a. And then the integral of sine is minus cosine t over 2 divided by 1 half, so that means multiply it by 2. So that's going to make the 2 out in front of 4. And then our limits of integration are 0 and 2 pi. That should. Should be enough. That's 
for a multiplied by cosine of pi. It's negative 1 times a negative. That's positive 1. And then minus a minus is plus. Cosine of 0 is 1. And so that gives us what we're looking for. That's our 8a. That's the length of an arch of the cycloid. This one let's just do by inspection. This says prove that that parameterization uh, is parameterized by arc length as long as x a squared plus b squared plus c squared is 1. What's the speed here? Or what's the, let me get the velocity first. What's the velocity? It's, it's ABC. All right. So that means the speed is necessarily the square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared. And so that follows that. Because for it to be an arc length parameterization, the speed has to be 1. The only way speed is 1 is if that's true. Right there. <clears throat> All right, so let's go to our save. Do this problem first, then we'll take a break. All right, so this is the homework one that was asked for. And it's not, not crazy different from the one we looked at a, at the beginning of the class. Let's at least get this all set up. So the distance for a hole in one, 420 feet. And we're going to air it into the cup. Seems like we should have a golf club that tells us exactly how to do that. A little meter on top. Should be possible. All right, so we'll start with the gravity thing. Say the only force acting on this, we're ignoring all the air resistance, blah, blah, blah. This will be two-dimensional motion. We'll just imagine a plane. And then we are integrating to get the velocity. Integrating a constant gives you a linear plus your initial velocity vector. And in this book, he uses u naught v naught for velocity, the initial velocity. Now remember that initial velocity, if we want to come off to the side, at some point we're going to have to uh, do this kind of thing. So if that's our initial velocity, the direction of our initial velocity. There's the u naught component, there's the v naught component, and they tell us that the angle is, are we trying to find the angle? At what angle? So angle, call that alpha. So this component here, and we are, stands, so 120 is our speed. So we're going to have u naught is going to be equal to 120 cosine of alpha. Oops, cosine alpha. And then v naught will be 120 sine alpha. So we'll plug those in in a moment. And then the position, we integrate again. We can merge the division by 2 into the vector there. So we get that for our first, first term. And then we're going to get, that's constant. So we're just going to multiplication by t, our linear term. And let's go ahead and throw those guys in. So we're going to have 120 cos alpha comma 120 sine alpha multiplied by t. Then we have initial position. Initial position is 0 comma 50, or 50 feet above our landing zone. So 0, 50, that's our initial position, or the ball's initial position. <clears throat> Clean it up by combining like, or combining corresponding uh, components. So we have 120 cos alpha comma, negative 16 t squared, plus buck 20 sine alpha, plus 
plus 50. So there's our position. Um, oh, did I use the wrong parameter? Let me just think. Yeah, t is, let me just read that again more carefully. Hit with initial velocity of 120 feet per second. At what angle should it be hit to land in the hole? Uh, no, no, those are different things. T is time, alpha is angle. I just know when you clean it up, then the, the second term there. Oh, there is a missing T there. Thank you. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Sorry. I misunderstood you. Yeah, there is a missing T right there. That has to have a sine alpha times T. I thought you were saying alpha could be T. Sorry. The cosine is one as well. And I didn't put one in the cosine either? What? Uh, I need a break. Now I understand. Yeah, I have to have a T in there. Got to distribute the T. Um, and we're trying to find this angle. So we, have, we basically have a system, right? Two equations, two unknowns. And <coughs> what do we know about the uh, X and Y at the terminal point there? X will be 420, Y will be zero. So that gives us a system. So we're going to have 420 equals 120 cosine alpha times T. And then zero will be the other one. 120 sine alpha times T plus 50. We've got that. So let's simplify a little bit. This top one, we're going to solve for t. So t will be equal to, let's see, 42 over 12. Is that 21 over 6, which is 7 over 2? Is that right? So 7 divided by that. We've got to substitute that in down here then. And we get, uh, we can also divide out at least a minus 2, I guess, is all we can divide out. Minus 2, so that will be 8. And then that thing squared. So I divide it out of minus 2, so that's minus 60 sine of alpha times t. 50. <laughs> so then we have to solve that for alpha. It tells you online to put it into a graphing utility, mm -hmm. but even what I did, I wasn't able to come up with an answer that my math lab liked. And what did they say to round it to? Did they? I don't know. So it says ball should be hit at an <laughs> angle. Uh, type an integer or decimal rounded to two decimal places. I can look at yours specifically and see if there's a typo in yours. So you got that far? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, help me solve it gets you all the way through. To this okay. Point. So then we'll type it in and get an alpha, and we'll solve it from there. Why don't we take a break? I'll type it into decimals and get those alpha values while you guys are out. Whatever you guys do <laughs> out there <laughs> in the far reaches of the campus. All right, let's get to the new stuff, the last stuff, the final stuff for this chapter. Curvature. We've talked a lot about it informally, curvature. And you can kind of see from this picture, they're just giving you a sense that uh, let's look at the unit tangent vector. A unit tangent vector has constant length. And if we look at the derivative of the unit tangent vector, what we're going to do is get an expression that only is going to have turning involved. It's not going to have any rate of change in terms of speed involved because we've already picked our unit tangent to be of constant length. So in other words, it's of constant speed 1. So when you take the derivative, that number that you get is only a number that's going to be uh, influencing the turning of the curve. So we'll call it curvature. 
the TDS. Now, here we're kind of assuming that we have a, a curve that is uh, parameterized according to that's parameterized according to S, according to Arkland. Uh, so again, that's not always the case. It's not always easy to get a parameterization according to arc length. If you can get a parameterization according to arc length, all you have to do is take the derivative of your unit tangent vector and you will get curvature. That's pretty impractical though for most cases. We rarely have that parameterization, so we need a computational formula that works for the generic parameter. So if we look at this definition here, you can treat differentials just like variables. If we divide the numerator by dt and the denominator by dt, we can pull it apart. We know that ds dt is, ds dt is velocity, and the absolute value of ds dt is speed. So it's doing the same thing that any derivative would do. If your parameter is s, your parameter is t, if you take the derivative, you're going to get velocity and speed no matter what. Just because the parameter is s and you take its derivative, that doesn't change anything. When you take the derivative, you still get speed. Okay? So ds dt, that's speed. And then dt dt, they just wrote it like that. So that's the derivative of the unit tangent vector, and then the length of the derivative of the unit tangent vector. And then they just rewrote it again. There, there's so many formulas for some of these Calc 3 concepts. What we'll do is pick the ones that make the most sense and try to stick with them instead of trying to learn all of them. It's overwhelming, there's so many. <clears throat> okay, so here is the general curvature formula, and this is the one that I think is probably the easiest one to wrap your head around. So if you're gonna think about that conceptually. It's actually not the one I would use day to day, because what we're normally given is R. There's no, there's an R prime there, and then there's a T. So you, to calculate with this, this of all these theoretical ones, I'd say this is the most practical because you're given R, you can find R prime, you can take R prime and divide it by R prime to get T, and then you can take the derivative of T. But there's a lot of those abstract steps, right? You've got your vector R, you take its derivative, you find its length, you divide to get capital T, then you have another vector. Do you have three components? You know, and you're trying to find the length of a vector that has three components, that can be a pain in the neck. So that's a decent one theoretically to think about, but the really most important one practically is going to be uh, this one down here. And they prove it to you on some page in there. It's a pretty long and involved proof, so I definitely don't want to go through it. That is the one that I think is the most practical when you're actually doing computation. And it's pretty easy to remember, too. And it's easy to compute because you're given R, so you can find V with the derivative and you can find A with the second derivative. And then you just go. You don't have to do any dividing to get the length of a vector. You know, it's, it's pretty easy to use that formula. Do you see all the steps up here that you have to follow? Right, because capital T is R prime divided by the length of R prime. That builds you a whole new vector. But then you have to take its derivative to get that. And then you have to take its length. So there's a lot of those steps going on. Whereas here, you give, get R, find V, find A, cross them, and then divide by the cube of the speed. That's going to be a lot faster. Let's do one like this, though. We'll, I picked an easier one. So let's do that. And then we'll use that one for the more complicated one that's in three-dimensional space. So R prime minus 2 sine of t and then minus 2 cosine t. Got that. We have to get the speed. Speed, we're going to square, square, add, take the square root. I should be able to cut to the chase by now on that one, I think. That's 2. The parameterization of that is a circle of radius 2. The r out in front. If you're not absolutely sure, just do it step by step. Square, square, add, take the square root. It's fine. All right, so we get a speed of 2. So according to that formula, we need to figure out capital T. So capital T, that's the unit tangent function, the unit tangent vector. That is found by doing R prime over the speed. So R prime over speed. So we take the two and we have to divide it into each of those. And I 
lost a minus there. Get you back in there. Okay, so that's the unit tangent vector. And then we have to take the derivative of that to get t prime, capital T prime. So that's going to be minus cosine t comma uh, sine of t. Now, again, I picked this one so it's not too crazy. This one's pretty easy. The length of t prime, what's that going to be? Cosine squared plus sine squared? One happens to be one. <clears throat> Most of them aren't going to be quite that simple. So that tells us then our curvature as a function of t is going to be one divided by the speed, so one half. So that is using the sort of theoretical definition. I want you to notice that this curve right here is a circle of radius 2, and we got the reciprocal of the radius for the curvature. So that, that matches with our intuition. All right, so circle of radius 5, curvature would be a fifth. Curvature is always the reciprocal of the radius. So now let's try this more complicated one. And as we're going through it, we're going to use that formula instead. And you'll be able to see, I think, why this formula is going to be a little easier to use. So we find our velocity vector. Find velocity. Here's velocity. Find acceleration. And I like to stack these because I'm going to cross them anyway. So I like that right under each other so we can do our cross product technique. Acceleration right below it. And the only other piece we need, we do need speed. So let's take the velocity vector and find the speed. And that is going to be 3. Let's see, 3 cosine squared. Since I'm just dealing with cosines and sines for this speed piece, I'm just going to use C for cosine and S for sine. So it'll be 3 cosine squared. And then the, the middle one squared is cosine squared. The last one squared will be 4 sine squared. And then we have to take the square root of all that. So that's going to be 4 cosine squared plus 4 sine squared, which is 4. And the square root of 4 is 2. There's our speed. OK. Now, if we were using the other technique, we would have to take the 2, divide it in to this vector to get our unit tangent vector, and then we'd have to take its derivative. In this case, it's not too bad because the speed is a constant. But this process of doing the cross product, I think it's definitely going to be easier. So v cross a, it's going to be a vector. We know that. Cross out the first column, and then do the main determinant for the other, for the, uh, for the result, for the i component or the x component. So we're going to have minus 2 cosine squared. And again, we're just using sines and cosines, so I'm just going to use a c. So minus 2 cosine squared. And then we have to subtract off the other diagonal. The other diagonal is 2 sine squared, and we're subtracting it off. So that's going to be minus 2 sine squared. Middle component, cross out the middle column. And we can do one of two things. We can do the main diagonal minus the other diagonal and change the sign. Or we can do the other diagonal minus the main diagonal, which is how I'll do it. So the other diagonal is going to be 2 root 3 sine squared. 2 root 3 sine squared minus 2 root 3 cosine squared. Uh, but then there's a minus, right? So it should be a plus, right? So this first one, uh, the other diagonal, this one, is going to be positive, and then minus a minus, so that should be positive. All right, and then the last component, cross out the third column, and we get minus root 3 sine cosine. Let's just use C's and S's since we're not dealing with anything 
other than cosines and sines, so sine and cosine, uh, plus the same exact thing. So those will cancel. So this all reduces to, factoring out minus 2 here, we have a sine squared plus cosine squared, which is 1. So this is going to be minus 2. Middle, we're going to end up with 2 root 3. And last, we're going to end up with a 0. Good? Now we're almost there. So we just have to find the length of that vector and then divide by the speed cubed. The length of this vector, length of E cross A. So that's the square root of the sum of the squares. That's 4 times 3, so that's 12. So that's 16, that's 4. And curvature then is equal to that divided by the 2 up there. So curvature is 2. Constant curvature of 2. Oh, cubed, cubed. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, cubed. So 4 divided by 8, so 1 half. Yes. 2 cubed. All right, so that's how we will find curvature. So that just tells us, so there's this thing called the osculating circle. And the osculating circle, if you look at, the, at a point on the curve, if you pick a point on the curve and you find the curvature, the osculating circle is the circle that will fit right in there. It's the circle, it's the best circular approximation to a graph at a point. In Calc 2, you did a bunch of the power series stuff where you found the best linear approximation, the best quadratic approximation, the best cubic approximation, you did that infinite series. So the osculating circle is actually the best circular approximation to a curve at a point. The radius of the osculating circle is just the circle of radius 2, reciprocal of the curvature. And so the osculating circle is going to be the circle that sits right in there with the reciprocal of the curvature. All right, let's go to <coughs> normal vectors. So the curvature, uh, like I kind of tried to get you to think about intuitively, the curvature is going to have to do with the component of acceleration that's normal or perpendicular to the velocity vector. And so what this, what this is telling us here, this principal unit normal, is that the, norm, the unit normal, so that's the, we have our unit tangent, and then our unit normal is going to be pointing perpendicular to the unit tangent right along the curve. So unit tangent is going to be pointing along the curve, and the unit normal is going to be pointing inside the curve. Right. And the unit normal will be found by taking the reciprocal of curvature and multiplying it by this vector here. If you have an arc length parameterization, that's a pretty impractical formula. Most of us, if we're asked to find the unit normal vector, would never use that formula. The next one makes a lot more sense. So if somebody says, hey, find a unit normal vector, you find your unit tangent, velocity over speed. Unit tangent, velocity over speed. Take its derivative and divide by its length. So the derivative of the unit tangent vector divided by its length will give you the unit normal vector. Okay, One obvious question is how, what I just said was that the derivative of the unit tangent vector gives the unit normal vector. So the implication is that the unit normal vector, or the derivative of the unit tangent, is automatically pointing perpendicular to t. Right? That's what this is saying here. So if we're going to assume that the unit normal and the unit tangent are perpendicular, and I'm saying, oh, we'll just take the derivative of the unit tangent vector, that will be the unit normal vector as long as you scale it properly. Then you have to say, well, why is the derivative of capital T perpendicular to T? Anyone know? What's the length of capital T? 
one, right? It's a unit tangent vector. And we had a theorem last week that said something about the derivative of a constant valued, or a curve that had constant uh, length. So the derivative vector has constant length one. Remember we talked about if you're on a circle or a sphere, the length of r is constant. Like if r is your position vector, if you had r equals one, you're either on a, cur on a circle if you're in two dimensions or a sphere if you're in three dimensions. And we had the theorem that said, oh, the velocity vector is going to be perpendicular in those two instances. So this is just an application of that theorem. The, the, we have a vector, t, a vector function, vector value function, parameterized curve. If you wanted to graph t as a curve in its own right, right? t is a curve in its own right. It's a function of t or s or whatever. And if you take its derivative, you will get something perpendicular because t has unit length. It's a constant has constant speed. The derivative, the derivative will be tangent, but we're talking about the derivative of the derivative, oh, okay. so right? Because right. t is the derivative of r, but now we're taking the derivative of t, right? So it, it's it's like it, it's, it's acceleration-ish. Right. Well, there's that core problem that where like velocity was orthogonal and acceleration. That's only if it's a circle, though. Oh, okay. Circle or sphere. So in general, when we have our curve, we will certainly have the unit tangent vector right there. And the unit normal vector is going to be right there. Acceleration is going to be in some, who knows where. Acceleration is just some, in some direction. And so the, the unit tangent vector is right there. This is going to be the unit normal right there. And because the unit tangent has constant length, its derivative will be perpendicular to it. And that was the thing that was pretty easy to show. The way I showed it last time, I said, oh, well, t dot t is a constant. Whatever that, I, I don't want to say k, because let's just say constant. And then if we take the derivative of both sides, we have to use the product rule here, so we get first derivative second plus second derivative first. We end up with two times this is equal to zero. The derivative of a constant is zero. Divide by two, and we get t times t prime is equal to zero. That shows us that t and its derivative are actually perpendicular. All right, so there is our general scenario. It's like that. And that makes the most sense then. If you want to find the unit normal vector, take the unit tangent, take its derivative, divide by its length, and then you'll get a unit vector in the n direction. Properties of the unit normal? T and n are orthogonal at all points on the curve. The principal normal points to the inside of the curve. So the normal, principal normal is going to be pointing this way. You can always say, oh, well, this is also normal to the curve. It's true, but that's minus n, where n is the principal normal. The principal normal will always turn into the curve all the time. All right. So let's go ahead and do one of these. So we've got a, a position vector here, a vector value function, parameterized curve, however you want to think of it. The velocity. This is a helix, circular helix, right circular helix. Can you see that it's a helix? If you look down in the xy plane, you just ignore the z component. That's a circle of radius 4. And then the 10t is affecting the height. So as t increases, you're moving higher and higher and higher. And the x and y are turning you around a circle. So it's, the z component pulls you out of the xy plane up as t is greater than 0 and increasing. So there's our v. The speed is equal to the square root of the sum of the squares. So we get four, we get four cosine squared plus four sine squared 
plus 100. Did I do that right? No, square root some of the squares. I didn't square that, six, that 4, so let's put a square on that too. Speed is the square root of the sum of the squares. All right, so that is going to turn into just 16. We have 16 sine squared plus cosine squared, so that's going to be 116 total underneath the square root. That probably can be reduced. Um, 4 goes into there twice, leaving 8, and then 36. Or maybe not. I don't know. It doesn't matter really right this second, but there might be a perfect square hiding in there. I can't think straight right now. Okay, the unit tangent vector is then the velocity divided by speed. Is it supposed to be the root of 132 instead of 116? Maybe, but I doubt it. But maybe, let's check. So square that, we get 16 cosine squared. Square that, we get 16 sine squared. Then 16 factors to the front, leaving sine squared plus cosine squared, giving us just 16. And then plus the 100. That gives us, did anyone figure out, is that a perfect square? 229. Or two square roots. Two, OK, thank you. Yeah, it seemed like four was going to go into there. All right, so we'll divide that in. So we're going to get two cosine of t over root 29, comma, negative 2 sine of t over root 29, and then uh, 5 over root 29. All right, so there is our unit tangent vector. And of course, if you're computing the unit tangent vector, you at least in your head, you should say, all right, is this really of unit length? That's going to be 4 29ths cosine squared plus 4 29ths sine squared. So that's all going to be 4 29ths. 4 29ths, and then this will be 25 29ths when you square it. And then 4 29ths plus 25 29ths is 29 So it's okay, it's 1. Convince yourself, at least loosely, that you're, that you're probably there. So now to find the unit normal vector, we take this derivative. This is what I was saying about that other formula for curvature. It can be a pain in the neck. If you're taking the derivative of the unit tangent vector, finding that length and dividing by that length, it can be time consuming. So let's find t prime here. We know this is going to be perpendicular because that's a unit vector. So the derivative here. this going for our derivative. That part's good. <laughs> now we have to find the length of that derivative. Square root. Sum squares. So that's going to be 4 29ths sine squared plus 4 29ths cosine squared. Factor out the 4 29 sine squared plus cosine squared is 1. So we end up with 4 29 and that turns into, once we take the square root, 2 over root 29. That's the length of t prime. Therefore, the unit normal vector will be, hmm, we divide by that 2 root 29, so we're going to multiply by root 29 over 2. So we're going to end up with minus sine of t, minus cosine of t, common zero. That'll be our unit normal. So these two vectors, t and n, are going to be really important. T and N form a, a unit, a pair of unit vectors that trace along the curve in three space. And those two vectors form a plane. And that plane, right, if you look at the span of those two vectors, that's probably where you may not know. Span just means like the 
all possible linear combinations of two vectors, like i and j. The span of i and j is the whole real plane, the whole Cartesian plane. The span of t and n just forms another plane that's kind of floating along your curve. They call that the osculating plane, and the osculating circle will live in the osculating plane. Uh, that's not super important. But what is important is that you have these two unit vectors that move along your curve. <clears throat> and the, that plane that's formed by t and n, your acceleration vector is in there. Your acceleration vector lives in the plane formed by unit vector t and unit vector n. And that's what we have to deal with next. And it's, it's intuitive. We've got this curve. It's sitting in the xy plane, and we've got all these vectors associated to it. I don't want to draw them all on there at once. But what we want to do is figure out, if there's acceleration, we want to know how much of the acceleration is in the direction of motion, how much of the acceleration is perpendicular to the motion, so that we can, we can figure out what the effects of that acceleration are. Now, are the effects by increasing or decreasing the speed, or the effects just by changing the direction of the motion, or whatever. <clears throat> now, again, there's going to be a whole bunch of formulas. So for the acceleration, in general, we're going to say, oh, there's going to be a scalar times a tangent vector plus a scalar times a normal vector. So we're going to write A as a linear combination of T and N. So it's, it's a, that's what that's called, a linear combo of T and N. <clears throat> and there's a bunch of ways to find it. Let's focus on this first one for a second. This formula, the, I, I, we said that the curvature really is, is going perpendicular to the motion, that the curvature has a measure of the perpendicular force. And so it's not surprising that you can write the, the component in the n direction as a multiple of, of curvature. We don't always want to go find the curvature, though. It's very common to be asked to find the components of acceleration, but not be asked to find the curvature explicitly. So this formula is nice if you know the curvature explicitly, but you probably are, are only given r. You're probably given your position vector, so you don't have your curvature explicitly. So that formula there is a lot more practical in terms of um, finding the component there. And there's going to be a really beautiful geometric way to remember that, because we've already done that. Now, if you remember that curvature is v cross a over the length of v squared, going to this it's pretty obvious also. You, know, you can get to that one pretty easily. Um, you know, our original definition of curvature that we had was that we were saying, oh, you could find curvature by doing the length of v cross a divided by the length of v uh, cubed. <coughs> And so if you plug that in right there, you get to this. Um, but let's look at this. I want to look at it geometrically, why that is what it is. And then over here, I, let, I, I said something about this earlier. Let me just say it again. That, and notice that that's an S. <coughs> so that means that that's a unit speed parameterization. It's parameterized by arc length. And if a curve is parameterized by arc length, its second derivative is going to give you the acceleration tangent to the curve. It's going to give you the acceleration in the direction of the curve because the unit tangent, because the um, because with the unit speed curve, all all first derivatives are um, one. Right? If it's a unit speed curve, the first derivative, the velocity vector, has length one. So if it's a unit speed curve, the second derivative, the only piece there that's going to it's that it's going to um, have to do with have to deal with is the speed along the curve itself. It's actually going to give you regular acceleration. The change in velocity is that if you have a unit speed curve and you take its second derivative, it'll tell you what the acceleration is along that curve. But again, you usually don't have that. So a much more practical definition. If you're given R, you can find V and A easily and then you can do that. And let's look at how simple those formulas actually are. You will be may hopefully not surprised. Uh, so I'm not going to draw a T on here. I'm going to draw a V, because you see that there's not a T in those formulas. Let's do that. And then let's get our acceleration in here. And let's imagine our components of acceleration. So there's going to be a component of acceleration tangential. 
What? <laughs> oh, that might have been that flip, that switch I flipped. Is that what happened? Maybe that's the power. <laughs> Who knows? All right, and then there is a component right there that's orthogonal. So what we've done is decomposed acceleration. And you can imagine it in a couple of different ways. So the component of acceleration that we're, the two that we're dealing with, this is the tangential component. That's the normal component. That's the acceleration vector. All right. So I'm not going to put capital T and capital N on there. Capital T, of course, is V divided by its length. It's a unit vector right down in there. N, of course, is a unit vector perpendicular. It's right there. I don't want to stick them in there and mess it up right now. <clears throat> so we're taking A. If we know V, projecting onto T or projecting onto V is the same thing. So we can do this. Do you see the parallelogram? We've got our implied parallelogram here. The implied parallelogram, if I draw it with, let's draw it with uh, this highlighter. So parallelogram, we've got that, we've got that. And then the implied parallelogram would continue kind of like that. Right? And let's look at the tangential component first. Isn't that tangential component the scalar component of A projected onto V? If I drew it as a vector, that would be the projection of A onto V. But I don't care about the whole vector. I just care about the length. So the length of the projection, maybe I'll write it though. So A sub t is the length of the projection of A onto V, which is really just the scalar component of A onto V, which is our formula. <coughs> that is V dot A over uh, the length of V. That's what we did back a few weeks ago. Scalar component, V dot A over the length V. All right, so that's good, that's great. That's that one. Now, how about the normal component? The normal component, do you see that that's actually the height of the parallelogram? This normal <coughs> component, that scalar, that number, is just the height of this implied parallelogram. Right? V is acting like the base. And that is the height of the parallelogram. It's also the distance. We did this application also. It's the distance between this point and that line. So to find the height of the parallelogram, we take its area and divide by its base. That gives us the height. And that's what this formula is. Right? V cross A length is the area of the yellow parallelogram. And if we find the speed, or geometrically, the length of this v vector, and then divide that into the area of the parallelogram, we'll get the height of the parallelogram, which is going to be our normal component, the, the, uh, the scalar in that direction. So those are the two formulas I would recommend using, because I think that they're very geometrically intuitive based on what we've already done. So let's do it. All right. Components of acceleration. Consider the following trajectory of moving objects on the tangential and normal components of acceleration. So let's first find V. There's our V vector. Well, let's find acceleration. Acceleration looks like that. Mm. And if it helps, draw this picture every time if you need to. It doesn't matter. So if we, the, the, the context is, we're basically doing 
the point to line distance or whatever. So if you have to draw the picture, you're projecting your A onto V, and I didn't draw my vector V like that. There we go, that's better. Might as well make that red lettering to match it. All right, so that's what we're looking at. And that tangential component, they call it A sub t, that's the length of the projection vector, right down there, projecting A onto V. Or we call that the scalar of A onto V. And that's just the dot product divided by the length of V. A sub n, A sub n, we're trying to find the height here, the normal vector, the unit normal is going to be pointing straight up like that, there's the unit tangent if I wanted to put it in there, there's unit tangent, there's unit normal, and projecting onto that n, that's just the height there, so we'll do the length of b cross a, divided by the speed. Which one of those two components can be negative just based on the math? When you look down there, which one of them can be negative? Tangential component, because a dot product can be positive or negative. But this thing over here is always positive. Right? It's the length of a cross product that's positive. Speed's always positive. So this one can be positive or negative, which is good, because that allows us to deal with the case where we have that classic decelerating type of motion, where the change in speed is going down. That situation. So if the red vector is the velocity vector and the blue vector is the acceleration vector, this is a situation where the tangential component should be negative because the speed is slowing down. There's a component tangential in the opposite direction of the motion. So this will be the classic decelerating situation where we think of decelerating as change of speed in the sense that it's getting smaller. So that's the one that has to be positive or negative, the tangential component. The normal component's always going to be positive. Acceleration is always pointing to the inside of the curve. Normal vector is always pointing to the inside, so they're always going to be pointing in, in the same relative direction. All right, let's compute. So V cross A, V dot A. When we dot these together, we get 4T. And the length of v is the square root of 1 plus 4t squared. That will be our tangential component. It's a function of t. Depends where you are on the curve. And then the other one, we will cross the two vectors. And when we cross two vectors in two-dimensional space, that vector points straight up. Take the plane. Take two vectors and cross, it will point in the z direction. So if you need to, you can absolutely do this. If you feel like, oh gosh, I'm going to make a mistake, you can add a z component and make it zero. And then just think about what happens here. When you cross out the i, zero. Cross out the j, zero. k is the only component that won't be zero. So that component will be the main diagonal, which is 2 minus 0, so it's 2. So the magnitude of that cross product is 2. And then our speed uh, we found to be square root 1 plus 4t squared. So that is the other important function. So what this allows us to do is write the acceleration vector as a function of t is going to be this expression times
times capital T plus this expression times capital N. So instead of using I and J as the two unit vectors for your linear combination, you use T and N. So instead of using some coordinate system that the curve is sitting in, you're actually looking on the curve itself and using the frame of the curve itself, the geometry of the curve. Uh, let's go back for one second. So any questions before we talk about the last topic? Any questions on, everyone see the geometry of the parallelogram, hopefully? In Calc 3, you definitely want to try to reduce things to what you already know. We've already talked about the scalar components and how you find those when you're projecting. So those are good to go back to instead of trying to remember new formulas. Remembering new formulas will give you a headache. Go with the old ones. Go with the old. Should we do one more of those before we go to the last topic? Let's do one more. Might as well do one more of those. Um, do one more before we do our binormal vector. We're not going to do a lot with binormal and torsion. We'll find, well, we're not going to do a ton. Uh, that's stuff that you do later in mechanics. All right, let's do uh, number 40. Composition. Components of acceleration, number 40. So in this one, we have the following curve. 20 cos 20 sine. So another helix like thing, depending on what t range is. All right, so it just says find our components. So finding the components, let's go ahead and find the velocity. the acceleration. Find the speed. Over smidge. Alright, so speed. We're going to square, 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 add. So 400 sine squared plus 400 cosine squared is just 400. So it's going to be 400 plus 900. Tangential, that's going to be the one that could possibly be negative, so that's the one with the dot product in it. And a sub n is the one with the cross product in it. It always has to be positive because acceleration points in and normal vector points in. All right, so let's go with the dot product one first. Dot these things together, we get negative times negative, which is positive 400 sine cosine. Again, I'm going to go with the S and the C thing since we're just dealing with sines and cosines. Dot the middle two, multiply the middle two, so we get minus 400 sine cosine. And then zero. And that looks like a lot of zero to me. So the tangential component is zero. So that means the only component uh, with respect to the t and n is, that's going to be non-zero will be the normal component. So all the acceleration is inward. And a sub n will cross these. 
So come up here, cross out the i's. We're going to get 0 minus a minus. So that's plus 600 sine of t. Uh, so that's the first component. I need a little more space there. So that's the first component. The second component, cross out that. Main diagonal, well actually let's do other diagonal. So it's going to be minus 600 cosine t minus 0. So minus 600 cosine t. And then the z component, 400 sine squared plus 400 cosine squared, 400. So we get that. And then we have to find the length of that. So let me put uh, the absolute value bars around it. So the length of that still divided by root 1300. We'll simplify that in a minute. So our normal component will be the length of all that. So we've got a square, 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 and add. <coughs> square that, we get 3600. Sine squared plus 3600 cosine squared, that's 3600 plus 400 squared, I didn't do that right, 600 squared is, is that right? 600, there should be more zeros, right? Should it be 360,000? Help me. Yeah. yeah. 360,000, right? If you square that, we get 36 plus four zeros. So that, 36,000. 360,000 sine squared plus 360,000 cosine squared, that's 360,000. Then we square that and we get 160,000, I believe. Double check, 16 and then four zeros. Yeah, oh boy. Now let's take the square root of that. Divided by the square root of 1,300. A lot of zeros. Um, maybe the first thing I'll do is just cancel out some zeros so I don't even have to think about adding such big numbers because it seems so scary. Alright, so 46, 5200 in there. And because I play cards, I know 13 goes into 52. Is it, no, is it 52? No, it's 52. Sorry. Okay, no problem. no problem. So 13 goes into there, so we get square root of 400, I believe. 20. All that to get to 20. All right, so there is our component in the tangential and the component in the uh, non tangential form. If we look at that acceleration vector right there, we, we could have done this a little bit faster if we used some uh, ingenuity. Look at that right there. What's the length of that vector? That squared plus that squared plus 0 squared, the length of that's 20, right? That's a circle of radius 20. And because we, if we use the uh, fact that there's no tangential component, we know all the accelerations inward we could have looked there and said, ooh, since it's all inward, it's got to be the magnitude of A. But, retrospect. OK. Binormal vector. So in three-dimensional space, we, or when we're dealing with the Cartesian space, we have IJK. Dealing with a curve in three-dimensional space, where we want to transfer our focus onto the curve, We've talked about t and we've talked about n. They form a plane that's going along with your curve. But your curve has a twisting component to it if it's in three space. Like if you're just dealing with the circle in two space, your t and your n are fine. That's enough. But if there starts to be twisting motion, like the helix, we need a third component. We need a third component that's geometrically connected to the t and the n. That will simply be the cross product of the two. Just like k is the cross product of i and j, b, the binormal, will be the cross product of t and n. And just like we had a 
factor in the xy plane for turning called curvature. We have a factor in the xyz space for twisting, which is called torsion. So curvature gives us a degree, gives us a measure of the turning. You know, with respect to the xy plane, it's the turning. And then torsion gives us a respect, gives us a, a, a measure of how much twist, how much twisting out of the plane is happening. How fast is it twisting out of the xy plane or out of a horizontal plane? How, more precisely, how fast is it twisting out of the tn plane? <laughs> the tn plane is where we're, our attention should be. So it's pretty simple to find the binormal vector. If you cross two unit vectors, you will get a perpendicular vector. And you just have to, the, the simplest way is going to be to make sure that it's a unit vector. If you cross T and N, you will get a unit vector. If you cross two unit vectors, you automatically get a unit vector. I, J cross gives K, which is a unit vector. But it's not always practical to find T and N. That can be a pain in the neck. That's a faster way. We know V, we can find, we, if we give, are given R, find V and find A fast. We know the cross product of V and A is perpendicular. So just take the cross product, divide by its length, and you've got a vector that's unit length that's perpendicular to V and A. And if it's perpendicular to V and A, it's perpendicular to T and N. Because V is in the direction of T, and uh, A is in the same plane as N and T. So yeah, perpendicular to V and A is the same as perpendicular to T and N. That's the simplest way to find it, hence the box around it. Torsion. There's a homework question that has to do with this. I, I probably won't put this on the, I, I won't put torsion on the test. It's kind of a more complicated formula, but we'll do it once. It's, it's not, I mean, if you have the formula, it's easy to do, but it's, it's one of those formulas that's kind of above and beyond for anyone to memorize. So if I asked you to do this on a test, I would definitely give you that formula. Torsion. Okay, so let's do this. Let's find binormal and torsion. So, again, let's just plow through, get V and A. That should be just sort of autopilot to get V and A. Always need velocity and acceleration for anything interesting. And once you have V and A, we'll cross them. Cross product will be orthogonal to both, perpendicular to both. So we're going to cross V and A. So V cross A. All right, cross out the J, and we get 25 sine squared plus 25 cosine squared, which is 25. 25 sine squared plus 25 cosine squared is 25. Cross out the j. Other diagonal is 0. Minus a minus is plus 60 sine of t for the j component. And then the k component looks to be main diagonal, so negative 60 cosine of t minus 0 for the other diagonal. That would be our cross product. So that is perpendicular to the osculating plane. It's perpendicular to T and N plane. <clears throat> and the length of it, square, 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 add. Square that, get 625. Square that, we get 3,600 sine squared plus 3,600 cosine squared, so that's 3,600. So that's all going to be like 4,225. <clears throat> 25 goes into there a bunch of times. 625 might even go into that thing. 65. 65, clean? Yeah. Nice, thank you. OK, so that means then that the binormal vector, the unit binormal, so T, N, and B are all understood to be unit vectors. We divide by 65. 
Five goes into there five times. Five goes into there uh, 16 times? No. One, 13. 13, 13. And then 12 13 sine of t, comma, minus 12 13 cosine of t. So that will be our unit binormal vector. Double check that it's a unit vector, at least in your head. 25 over 169, and then this will be 144 over 169. 25 plus 144 is 169 over 169, which is 1. So there's the binormal vector, and we'll do one computation of torsion with that nutty formula there. So torsion, we have to do V cross A, which we already did. Uh, one thing we didn't do that we need to do for torsion is we've got to go one step even further. We have to find A prime. What do they call that in physics? The derivative of the acceleration? What is it? Is it a jerk, maybe? I think, yeah, jerk. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, 0 minus 5 cosine derivative will be positive 5 sine, and then negative 5 cosine, the jerk. OK, so that's also our triple prime. And so what we need to do is take the dot product of a, so uh, of v cross a and a prime. So we have to take the dot product of those two right there. So those two right there. Does everybody see that? So v cross a is right there. Dot it with a prime. So those two. <clears throat> so when we dot product those together, we will get zero, and then 300 sine squared, I'll just use an S, and then plus 300 cosine squared. Cosine squared. And that's it, right? That's all in the numerator. Denominator is the length of V cross A squared. The length of V cross A right there, and then we square it. 65 squared. So the torsion will be 300 divided by 65 squared. So we just need to cancel some common factors, and hopefully it doesn't look too crazy afterwards. 65 squared. Math. Oh. Yep, 12 or 169, yes. And so this has the same kind of interpretation as curvature. The bigger the number, the more rapidly it's turning and twisting out of the TN plane. And the smaller it is, the slower it's twisting out of that plane. Yeah? Is that the radius of the sphere? I think it was inverted. Right, good question. So do we have an osculating sphere, and is its radius the reciprocal of torsion? I don't know. I will find out, though. That's a really good question. Yeah, I've got to think about that. I've, been, I've never seen a spherical approximation to occur, but that would actually seem to be a natural extrapolation from an osculating circle. I will check it out. Great question. All right, so on Wednesday, I'll, come, I'll bring out a study sheet on Wednesday, a study guide for example, <coughs> on a week from today. We'll, it will be all of chapter 9. Um, 11, sorry, 11. I must be able to flip them. I should be looking now, chapter 11. All of chapter 11. You might not want it on chapter 9. Isn't that the power series chapter? Yeah, I like it. It's the power series chapter. <laughs> All right, I will see y'all Wednesday. <laughs>